Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar titled Updates on FISMA Legal Research Efforts. We're excited today to present on this project and provide an update for all of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Elizabeth Newbold, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Northeast Center to Advance Food Safety, or NECAFS. And I'm pleased to be joined today by Chris Callahan, who is NECAFS Director, Sophia Khrushchevsky, the Clinic Director at the Center for Ag and Food Systems at Vermont Law School, and Samuel Ingraham, Lauren Westenberg, and Lindsay DeMay, who are all law students and legal clinicians at the Center for Ag and Food Systems at Vermont Law School. So before we jump in, I want to launch a poll to get a sense of who's on the webinar today. So should have popped up on your screen now. If you can go ahead and just click what best describes you, and you can choose more than one option to describe your role within the produce community. So if you feel like you fall within more, go ahead and select um, other options. And I'll leave this poll open for a few seconds as people select their roles within the world of produce. So we're at 79% voted. So I'll just give it a few seconds as it looks like most people are responding. Okay. Great, all right, well, thanks for that. I'll go ahead and close that poll. And now I'll go ahead and open another poll. And this is just to get a sense of how you learned about the webinar today. And this is uh, just select one answer to let us know how you heard about today's presentation so we can get a sense of which of our communication channels are most effective. And we really appreciate you providing this feedback to us. And so I'll just give that another second as people vote. Okay, great. Thank you again. And I'll go ahead and close that poll. So um, before we get into the presentations, I first wanted to orient everybody to this project and introduce what we're doing to you today. So the title of the project is the Extension Legal Services Initiatives. This is a partnership between Vermont Law School and NECAFS. Um, and it's a, funded through the National Ag Library at the United States Department of Agriculture. This is a two-year project. Um, we've just finished the first year and are starting into the second. Uh, it's national in scope. And the first year was focused on really defining legal questions and conducting research. Um, with some development of educational materials. And the second year will be focused on further development, um, probably additional research, and then uh, doing outreach around those educational materials and uh, research findings. And so the goal of this project was to frame and form common FISMA produce safety rule questions that needed to be clarified through legal research, and then extend those projects results through education and outreach. And so, the reason for this project, the motivation and approach, was because, as you all know, the produce safety rule is a significant development uh, for growers related to produce safety. And so it was becoming clearer and clearer through project partners that there was really a need to explore some of these common legal questions and concerns and um, try to help inform the produce community around these, these priority questions. And so in order to best understand from a national perspective what those questions were, to launch the project, we did a national survey that was um, a collection of these comments and concerns from across the industry um, as well as across the nation so that we were uh, ensuring that we were capturing geographic and uh, a range of, of industry perspectives. And so with those responses, we formed and prioritized legal questions. Uh, those, I, I also just want to emphasize that the, the research is grounded in existing case law and statutory law or other similar regulatory schemes. This project does not serve to define or interpret the produce safety rule in any way, but rather drawing from existing authority to best inform how a question might be answered through the uh, produce safety lens. And so uh, continue to please look to your states and to FDA for authority when it comes to the produce safety rule. 
And so I just wanted to kind of emphasize the range of responses we did get when we received uh, feedback through our survey. We had total a total of 89 responses that were distributed across the nation. And the thing that I wanted to emphasize, because I think is really important when it came to the individuals in the in the proto safety community that responded, 44, 42% of those were growers. Uh, followed by 22% educators and then regulatory community at 13% and then um, onward as you can see on the slide. And so we felt very comfortable that we were hearing the grower voice in the responses we received um, and informed of the that informed these questions. And so with that, I'll now turn the presentation over to Sophia who will talk about um, the actual process of forming and framing the questions and uh, the questions that were identified. So go ahead, Sophia. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, so as Elizabeth mentioned, the, the research questions that we've been pursuing through the Food and Agriculture Clinic here at Vermont Law School come primarily through the survey that we conducted um, late in 2018. Um, and then also comes through the input of our advisory group, which is made up of uh, growers, educators, regulators, and others spread across the country. Um, and so with that input, we were able to identify questions that fit into the following topic areas, uh, questions related to liability, so primarily the civil and criminal liability consequences for the different players involved in producing and marketing produce in the event of a foodborne illness outbreak from produce. Um, and how the produce safety rule impacts or changes any of that liability. Uh, business structures and operations, so how do the operational structure or business formation of different produce operations impact compliance obligations under the produce safety rule? What are the legal implications of or differences between a food safety audit and a FISMA inspection? How can an entity prove that the variances or alternatives it's using provide the same level of public health protection as what FISMA requires? Questions about the federal policy process generally, so where does FISMA come from, what is the rulemaking process, and what is the relationship between statute, regulations, guidance, responses via the technical assistance network, and how are those different tools used. Um, questions that look at the obligations of qualified exempt farms that are selling to facilities that are subject to the preventive controls rule supplier verification program. Uh, looking at the interplay between privacy and access to information held by the government. Um, a lot of questions around enforcement. How does the produce safety rule implementation address issues of noncompliance? What is the appeals process? How do these issues of enforcement appeals uh, vary based on who the enforcer is, so FDA versus the state, and whether enforcement will vary um, based on whether it follows a routine or for cause inspection, et cetera. Um, Questions related to the legal and practical implications of an exemption or qualified exemption under FISMA, how they're verified for compliance purposes, whether qualified exempt farms can opt into a full inspection. If so, could they opt out later? Um, also questions about how the produce safety will interact with other state laws, particularly around issues of environmental compliance and how growers should plan to handle those potential areas of overlap or conflict. Um, and then some questions about insurance and how FISMA requirements might interact with product liability insurance coverage. And so our research so far has taken us through sort of the top uh, two thirds of this list. And um, many of the questions have a lot of overlapping components and some of them contain elements that we really haven't been able to fully tackle yet because some aspects of the rule might still be unresolved or particularly in the case of implementation and enforcement, it's still in very early stages. Um, and so because this is a two-year project, we have decided to start working on some of the questions that we could answer a bit more immediately, uh, or where we could look to other more established federal statutes to identify themes that might be common across different regulatory frameworks. And so we presented on the first two topics on liability and business structures last spring. Um, that webinar has been archived to the NECAPS website and you can view it there. Uh, over the summer, we focused on audits versus inspections and the preventive control rule supply chain program and those questions related to the federal policymaking process. And then this fall, we've built out even further our analysis on this question of business entity formation and added on questions related to alternatives and variances mm -hmm. 
and how questions submitted through the Technical Assistance Network could be made available to the public. Um, and so in addition to these webinars, we're also developing some fact sheets related to these different topics that explain our research. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of our work ahead has to do with questions of compliance and enforcement and appeals, much of which is state-specific information. Um, so we're going to continue to be focusing in on those areas of the law, as well as disseminating information on the legal research questions we've addressed to date starting in January as we enter the second year of our project. Um, so before we begin the student presentations today, I just have to include a reminder. Um, I know Elizabeth mentioned this, but just to stress that the information we're providing today is not legal advice. It's intended for educational purposes only. We're very eager to hear your questions and your feedback about how to translate this information into quality, relevant educational resources, um, as well as additional scenarios that can help us apply the analysis and illustrate possible outcomes, but we are not providing any specific legal advice through this forum. So with that, we will begin uh, with a presentation on our expanded analysis on the implications of how separate legal entities might factor into CSR compliance. Go ahead, Sam. So hi there, my name is Sam Ingram. I am one of the three Center for Agriculture and Food Systems student clinicians from Vermont Law School, working in partnership with the Northeast Center to Advance Food Safety to analyze the Food Safety Modernization Act, or, or FISMA, and create outre outreach material. Over the past few months, I've been researching how the FDA and state regulators implementing FISMA are likely to analyze what constitutes a farm business under the Produce Safety Rule, or PSR. Based on my research, I've identified factors that could be applied to situations where it's not clear whether multiple legal entities should be considered together as part of a single operation for PSR compliance purposes or considered separately, as their legal structure might suggest. We conducted initial research into this question last spring, but my role was to provide further comparative analysis in order to expand our findings on this particular issue. My topic today comes from a definitional problem. The FDA defines a farm in part as an operation under one management. Because of this definition, there are some situations where multiple legal entities could conceivably be considered one farm business for the purposes of whether or not a business will meet exemption thresholds under the produce safety rule. For example, if you've got a commodity crop farm which also grows produce, but the businesses which do the sales for those crops are structured as two separate LLCs, you might not know whether or not you're gonna be treated as one or two entities. The FISMA regulations identify this as an issue, but do not resolve it. So in addition to digging into the preambles to the Preventive Controls Rule and the PSR, I also wanted to look at other comparable federal statutes and their relevant case law to understand what factors the FDA might use when considering what constitutes an operation under one management when there are multiple separate legal entities. First, I'll go over the factors that we identified and then look at each more specifically. After, I'll give an example and work it through with you under our suggested analysis. One final point of clarity, the test that we're providing is based and reliant upon our research comparing how other agencies have approached similar questions and how the courts have interpreted those other laws. We don't yet have case law in FISMA which speaks to this question in part due to its recentness, but also because FISMA as a statute is silent on this issue. So the comparable case law we use to identify these factors comes from four different federal agencies. The first is from the FDA and its various guidance documents and rules related to the PSR and the Preventive Controls Rule. We are able to use the FDA's framing of these issues in order to guide our search. The second source is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Specifically, we looked at the USDA's policies under its Commodities Payments Program and case law surrounding the application of the National Organics Program. Those policies dealt with questions of what constitutes farm management and how agencies can distinguish on a case-to-case, fact-specific basis. The third place we looked was the Department of Labor and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Much of the case law surrounding the Fair Labor Standards Act gets into questions of what constitutes management, ownership, and control of entities for the purposes of analyzing them under its statutory requirements. It's essentially answering many of the same questions posed under FISMA. Finally, we looked at the EPA and the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liabilities Act, or CERCLA. CERCLA imposes liability upon polluters and does so by looking past traditional notions of legal separateness. CERCLA was thus another statute that could give guidance as to how the FDA might choose to decide what really constitutes an operation under one management when there are multiple legal entities. One final note here is that some of these factors may vary based on whether it is the state or the FDA that is enforcing compliance. Some of the principles discussed related to when a regulator may look past the legal boundaries of a business, often referred to as piercing the corporate veil, and which is based on state law, uh, 
and therefore the outcome may very look, look very different depending on who is enforcing the PSR and the nuances of state law. And since the question posed was really, how is the FDA likely to behave, we had to first understand which of the comparable federal agencies the FDA had the most in common with, both in terms of purpose and in terms of regulation implementation. At the risk of oversimplifying, we ended up using a bit of a Goldilocks approach. At one end of our behavior spectrum is the USDA, likely to be more expansive in terms of what is considered a farm or farm manager to benefit the industry it's tasked with promoting. At the other end is the EPA, which has a statutory mandate that allows it to ignore traditional legal boundaries as a way of finding some entity to place cleanup costs on. At center, then, is the Department of Labor and the Fair Labor Standards Act. The DOL has had a similar task in front of them that the FDA has been given under FISMA, namely that of deciding how and when a series of businesses becomes, in the Fair Labor Standards Act language, an enterprise rather than just a bunch of separate businesses. In the Fair Labor Standards Act, there's specific statutory language that gives regulatory authorities the ability to combine multiple entities into a single enterprise where appropriate in order to find that certain regulations apply to that enterprise. Although the FDA suggests this could be done under its definition of a farm as an operation, FISMA contains no such mandate. However, the lack of a statutory grant of that breadth does not mean that operations under one management could not include multiple corporate or other organizational units. The Fair Labor Standards Act case law was also particularly handy because many of the principles it identifies for looking past legal boundaries in the labor context are the same as those factors that are used in common law under situations of corporate veil piercing or the process of looking past legal boundaries to determine when one company is really a shell for the activities of another. Because of its similarity of purpose and its similarity to the reasoning behind state corporate law, then we went forward with the idea in mind that the FDA is most likely to use approaches and reasoning similar to the DOL with the caveat that we also wanted to bring in the reasoning that other federal agencies use to justify their own rules. We were able to boil down the research into five relevant factors that we think are most relevant to the question of whether separate legal entities might be considered part of the same operation under one management under FISMA. The first is the geographic proximity of separate farm entities. The second is the degree of shared ownership between separate farm entities. The third is the degree of operative management by the same individuals between the separate legal entities. The fourth is the interdependence of the entities, or whether the entities would not be able to survive as businesses without one another. And the fifth and final is whether the agents of the entities respect the formal legal boundaries between the entities. Individually, these factors are unlikely to be determinative. Rather, it's the entire confluence of these factors that is likely to inform the outcome of whether the entities could be considered one singular farm business operation. So, just common ownership or just common land alone is unlikely to determine a single operation under one management. Also, the FDA has discretion to consider these situations and apply these factors on a case-to-case -case basis. So one ruling does not necessarily determine the outcome of another, even if similar facts are present. Finally, it's important to note again that these factors come from analogous case law and so are only inferences as to what we believe the FDA may act on. And we cannot for certain say that the FDA will use these factors. Again, state law determining corporate veil piercing or the capacity of regulators to look past formal legal structures may influence these factors further on a state-to-state -state basis. The first factor is geographic proximity. The FDA defines a farm as one operation under one management that may be located in one general but not necessarily contiguous physical location. In the preamble to the PSR, the FDA clarified that this change in language was meant to reflect the necessities of running a farm business. Importantly, the FDA has not indicated that farms proximal to each other that are otherwise unrelated will be lumped together for the purposes of PSR analysis. Put simply, while location alone does not determine whether two businesses are part of the same farm operation, if you're growing and storing all your crops in the same general parcel of land for one business as you are for another, it's more likely that those two businesses are part of a single farm operation than if those two businesses exist 50 miles away from each other. The next factor comes largely from the Fair Labor Standards Act and CERCLA cases. It looks at whether there's shared ownership between the business entities. Functionally, the more complete the ownership is, the more influential that ownership will be on whether the FDA finds there's a single operation. If one person owns both businesses in their entirety, that's more influential than if one person owns one business and then owns a fifth of another business. However, complete ownership by a single person of both businesses doesn't necessarily mean that there will be one operation under one management. The FDA has stated that the relevant entity is the farm business and truly seems to suggest that what they care about are the totality of circumstances rather than just one aspect. 
The third factor comes from the USDA, the EPA, and the DOL under their various acts. Those acts inform what sort of management the FDA may be alluding to when it defines a farm as an operation under one management. This factor looks at the degree of shared management within the businesses in question. If the decision makers of each entity also partake in the day-to-day -day business activities of the other entity, it suggests that there's really only one operation at hand. Furthermore, it is likely that this managerial interference doesn't have to be a two-way street and can likely be met if the management of one entity takes a hand in the day-to-day -day business decisions of the other entity without necessarily getting into the question of whether the second entity does the same thing. The fourth factor comes from the Fair Labor Standards Act. It looks at what degree the actual aspects of running and succeeding as a business are shared. This looks at the assets of the business in the form of equipment, buildings, and employees. The more of these that are shared between the entities, the more influential it is that there's actually a single operation. This factor has another side, which looks at financial interdependence. This side of it can look like the business is sharing funding, one business paying out another salaries, operational costs between the businesses being paid out of one account, or the intermingling of accounts between the businesses. It also looks at the markets that the businesses are aimed at and whether there's reliance by one entity or both on the other to succeed. The more of these aspects that are shared between the two entities, the more likely that it is that the FDA might find that there's an operation under one management. The final factor looks at the behavior of the agents of the business and the source from the Fair Labor Standards Act, CERCLA, and traditional corporate law. This factor is less likely to arise in the family farm context and is more likely to be relevant where there are more complex business structures. It asks whether the agents of the business treat the businesses as separate entities and respect those formal legal boundaries that are attended on that separation, such as acting strictly for the good of one entity rather than both. Regulators can look to the behavior as to the degree of shared business activities, but also within the documented communications that agents of the business produce discussing shared business strategies, operational concerns, and market goals. Finally, I'd like to go through an example. Uh, in this example, there's one producer that owns and operates a farm on one plot of land that grows commodity crops, we'll say soybeans and field corn, as well as vegetables. The commodity crops, which are all sold for animal feed, have sales on average in the previous three years of 300,000, and the vegetables have an average in the previous three years of 300,000. There's no shared equipment between the commodity crops and the vegetables. A business structure has been set up with the commodity crop operation as one LLC owned by the producer and the vegetable operation as a separate LLC owned by the producer and two others equally, but they operate from the same location. So there are considerations resulting in one produce operation, uh, and it may be easier to show a separation of the operations since the day-to-day -day activities across the operations are likely not similar and therefore more distinguishable. It's also likely that these two operations have different equipment, different storage facilities, and different plant and harvest schedules. However, we must also consider the business's practical operations. If the commodity crop and vegetable operations share resources, or if the split ownership LLC sourced resources from the first LLC, such as money, bank accounts, buildings, and the two LLCs have the same employees with management that partakes in the day-to-day decision-making of both LLCs, then they will likely be considered one farm operation and inseparable. Even though the operations are separate LLCs, produce multiple food types with different day-to-day -day activities, and they maintain separate equipment, the businesses are sharing ownership, management, land, financial resources, employees, and other assets. In this case, they would be so interconnected that they would likely be considered one farm operation. On the other hand, there's considerations resulting in a produce operation being separate operations. And it might be easier to show the separation when an operation is producing different food types, especially where there's split ownership or where different equipment must be kept or employees must be trained with specialized skills for each operation. The commodity crop and vegetable businesses may be considered two farm operations and separate if they maintain separate equipment, keep separate books, hire different employees, and effectively manage the two operations separately. This likelihood increases if the LLCs source their financing differently and if the two LLCs are not interdependent upon each other for existing in their separate markets. Even though they are operating on the same location under one producer's management and other elements may overlap, for example, they share on-farm buildings, the LLCs could be considered two separate farm operations where financial, human resources, and day-to-day -day business activities are separate. The more distinguishable the business assets and day-to-day -day operations are from each other, the more likely they are to be considered separate operations. And that's only one example, and there are many scenarios, but I'd like to leave you with some takeaways. 
The first is that uh, these factors are inferences as to how the FDA may behave based upon comparable federal agencies and their associated law. Furthermore, depending upon how much the FDA chooses to extend their authority to state regulators, these factors may be influenced by state law around corporate veil piercing. Finally, the FDA wants to look at the totality of the circumstances. The FDA has said in their preambles that they don't anticipate a lot of people fraudulently splitting up legal structures to avoid compliance. It also seems like their scrutiny is likely to be tied to the size of the producer within its market, meaning the bigger you are, the more you can expect the FDA to take an interest in your legal structures. The most important takeaway here is to consider the full set of factors and the other reasons why from a business perspective, it makes sense to split into multiple legal entities. Those other reasons are usually reflected in the activities of business and that these factors will end up looking into anyway. If the only purpose of separating businesses has been to avoid compliance under FISMA, that purpose will usually be drawn out by the analysis of these factors. Thank you for your time and I'll pass this off to Lauren. Thank you, Sam. Hello, my name is Lauren Wittenberg, and I'm a student clinician at Vermont Law School. This semester, I worked with our clinic team on analyzing the agricultural water quality requirements established in the Produce Safety Rule, which I will call the PSR, and how FDA's allowance for alternatives and variances may affect how farms reach compliance with PSR requirements. Just a moment, please. Specifically, I researched the differences between alternatives and variances, including who is eligible to use an alternative or variance, whether they require pre-approval by FDA, and how they compare in terms of scope. As I will discuss momentarily, alternatives are the options directly available to individual producer farmers, so I also examined what requirements a farm must meet to use an alternative. Today, I'll start this presentation with a brief explanation of the standards for agricultural water quality as they are currently established under the PSR. Then, I will discuss how FDA created allowances in the PSR for farmers to use alternatives and variances under certain conditions. To use either an alternative or variance, it must provide the same level of public health protection as the standards established in the PSR. So I will discuss some points to consider for what FDA may require someone to do to show that the same level of public health protection is provided by the alternative or variance. Finally, I will discuss the compliance date extension for PSR agricultural water quality standards and what that means for the likelihood that someone will make use of an alternative or variance. FDA conducted a hazard assessment to identify sources of produce contamination that led to foodborne illness outbreak. One major source of contamination the agency identified was from contaminated agricultural water applied to produce before harvest or used to wash produce after harvest. Contaminants which lead to foodborne illnesses include bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Introducing these contaminants into the food chain at the time of harvest can lead to issues of spread and magnification throughout processing. Sorry, we're going to pause for just one minute. Elizabeth, could you adjust the settings? Lauren doesn't seem to be able to advance her slides. Yep, go ahead and give it a try again. Uh, still no control. Sophia, do you want me to give the control to you since you didn't have a problem? To, sure. to advance our slides, since you know, is that okay? Okay. Yep. Thank, thanks, everybody. We're good on this one. Okay. okay. For example, if a couple of harvested snap peas are contaminated with E. coli at the time of harvest, they may spread that contamination to the rest of a shipment of peas as they are stored and shipped to the next stages of processing before they reach market. This could lead to the spread of any bacteria, viruses, and parasites that are contained on produce and amplify that throughout the food chain. In subpart E of the PSR, FDA established standards to combat contamination from agricultural water quality sources. The standards primarily focus on water quality testing and are required to test each agricultural water source independently. The rule sets, re the rule sets required frequencies for testing agricultural water sources, defines the number of samples required from each water source, sets maximum acceptable contamination limits, 
and describes options for farmers with contaminated water. Testing requirements apply to untreated groundwater and surface water sources. If your agricultural water comes from a treated source, then you simply have to receive documentation from your water provider to show that the water is within allowable contamination limits. Collected water samples must be tested for the presence of generic E. coli. Generic E. coli is one of the primary bacteria used to estimate the contamination level of water sources. Based on guidance from the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the World Health Organization, FDA also chose to adopt generic E. coli as the microbial test for agricultural water quality under the PSR. FDA has approved several specific lab tests that detect the level of E. coli contamination in the collected water samples and has set the maximum allowable contamination limit for agricultural water used on farms. This is based on measuring the colony forming units of bacteria in a sample, which is the number of colonies that form on a petri dish, like the one shown on the right, when tested in lab settings. If your water is out of compliance, you have a couple of options. First is to calculate how many days it will take to reach the acceptable contamination level, assuming a 0.5 log reduction in E. coli per day. If your water takes more than four days to reach the allowable limit, you cannot use it on your crops without first treating it. If you calculate that your water is in compliance after a three-day wait period, then you may use your agricultural water. If your water cannot reach compliance within a four-day period, you must treat your water. You may also choose to treat your water at any time, regardless of whether it reaches compliance within the four-day allowable waiting period or not. FDA also allowed for individuals to propose and use alternatives to, the four, to four of the testing requirements under certain circumstances. The four allowable alternatives include testing for something other than generic E. coli, for example, if you want to test for a different pathogen, like a fecal coliform instead of E. coli, assuming a different die-off rate when calculating how many days to wait between application and harvest. For example, if you live in a hot, arid region, there may be evidence to show that there's a higher die-off rate than the 0.5 log reduction established as the minimum baseline by FDA. You may also use a different initial sample size for an untreated water source or a different annual sample size for an untreated water source. These are the only four requirements for which an individual can develop and use an alternative measure to satisfy the requirements of the PSR. So how do you develop and use an alternative? So individual farms use alternatives in practice. They can adopt an alternative that was developed by someone else. For example, state departments of agriculture, commodity boards, or trade associations may have scientific data that show that within their state, there is a higher rate of microbial die-off than the one proposed in the PSR. Those groups could make that information available for farmers to use when making their microbial die-off calculation to determine if they can use their agricultural water. There is no FDA pre-approval process to use an alternative. Farmers don't need to submit anything to FDA, and although FDA has indicated that it is willing to review potential alternatives, if farmers voluntarily choose to seek pre-approval, there's no identified process to date for submitting proposed alternatives to FDA for review. Although no pre-approval is required, before farms can use an alternative, they must be able to show that the alternative provides the same level of public health protection as the official standards established under the PSR. Once that determination is made, the farm must also keep all relevant documentation that shows that the alternative meets the requirement as part of their on-farm records. During a farm inspection, FDA can request to see documentation of the same level of public health determination for any alternatives in use. At that point, FDA may perform its own independent review of that information to see if the agency agrees that the alternative provides the same level of public health protection as the established PSR standards. If FDA finds that the alternative does not provide the same level of public health protection, the farm may be held liable for being out of compliance with the PSR. If a farm is out of compliance with PSR requirements, it may not be able to sell its produce on the market, and it may be liable for enforcement actions by FDA. However, there is another mechanism which doesn't place the full burden of developing and using alternative measures on farmers alone. Subpart P of the Produce Safety Rule established an opportunity for government authorities who are in charge of food safety regulations to request variances from any number of PSR standards. This includes food safety authorities and state governments, federally recognized tribes, and in foreign countries that export produce to the United States. Variances may cover far more than, only, than the only four agricultural water quality standards eligible for, for alternatives. Variances may request that different requirements for building and equipment, training, wildlife exclusion, 
or agricultural water quality apply to produce farms in a given state or region. To request a variance, the authority must file a citizen petition with FDA, which includes a statement that describes how the different measures proposed in the variance request provide the same level of public health protection and are necessary in light of local growing conditions. FDA must review and approve a variance request before farmers within that state, tribe, or foreign country can use the different measures proposed in the petition. If the variance is approved, those farmers are allowed to rely on the granted variance when using the different measures outlined in the variance request. Alternatives and variances both require an evaluation to determine if the different measures provide the same level of public health protection as the measures developed by FDA and established in the PSR. Draft guidance from FDA provides insight on how to make sure that the evaluation meets FDA's requirement that it show that the different measure provides the same level of public health protection. First, the evaluation should be conducted by an expert. The person conducting the evaluation should have should have expertise either through training, experience, education, or some combination of the three. Second, FDA says that the evaluation should be as thorough as the analysis performed by FDA before setting the standards in the PSR. FDA performed a thorough epidemiological study, which assessed potential sources of risk and how those sources and levels of contamination risk related to foodborne illness outcomes. The evaluation done by the expert should be as thorough as that study. Third, the measure or measures proposed for an alternative or variance should be sufficiently supported by credible scientific and technical evidence. This is related to the thoroughness of the evaluation done by the expert. The data supporting the evaluation should be robust, which means that there needs to be a large amount of data to support the conclusion drawn by the evaluation. Finally, if the evaluation is for an alternative, the records from the evaluation should be made available to the individual farm hoping to use the alternative. FDA may request those records during an inspection of the farm. In March 2019, FDA finalized an extension for compliance dates for the agricultural water quality requirements under subpart E. The new rolling deadline for reaching compliance with agricultural water quality requirements is from 2022 to 2024. This extension follows criticism that the agricultural water quality standards in the PSR are not practical for many produce farmers and are perceived as inflexible or overly burdensome. FDA extended the compliance deadline to give the agency time to review and potentially change the agricultural water quality standards in the PSR in the next few years. The extension also provides more time for individuals and entities looking to develop an alternative to collect data and information on what kinds of alternatives may be suitable for their particular production regions and production practices. There are some states that are also interested in developing substitute measures, and this compliance deadline gives additional time for government authorities to develop variance requests. The PSR establishes standards for agricultural water quality in order to protect the public from contamination that could lead to foodborne illnesses. To that end, the PSR sets specific requirements related to the testing frequency and acceptable microbial contamination limits of agricultural water sources. Individual farmers are able to develop and adopt alternatives to four of those requirements, though they must be able to show that the alternative provides the same level of health protection as the requirements established in the PSR. Meeting this expectation of same level of public health protection places a high burden on farmers. Even if a farm adopts an alternative developed and evaluated by a third party, and doesn't have to personally cover the cost of the evaluation, the farm still is liable if FDA reviews the evaluation and determines that the alternative does not actually provide the same level of protection. So FDA suggests that it might pre-approve alternatives, it has not yet identified a specific process for doing so. It is possible that working through regional centers like NECAF could be a way to explore the pre-approval process as regional centers have a more direct line of communication with FDA. Variances allow government authorities to propose different measures to fulfill PSR requirements on behalf of the farmers in their state, tribe, or foreign country and apply beyond the agricultural water quality standards alone. Variances must be approved by FDA before being used by farmers within the region. By placing the burden on government authorities and FDA, the burden placed on individuals is significantly reduced. Given the required pre-approval, FDA will also not find an individual substitute measure insufficient unless the farm is not properly complying with the substitute measure described in the granted variance. Finally, though FDA may choose to revoke a variance, they will not review the use of the variance measures during each independent farm inspection. With that, I'll pass this over to Lindsay. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, 
and hello everyone. My name is Lindsay DeMay and I will be giving the final presentation today. Let's see if I have control. <laughs> For the past few months, I've been researching how to access more information about how to comply with FISMA. In doing so, I considered whether any or all questions submitted to FDA's Technical Assistance Network and FDA's subsequent responses could be made publicly available. In this presentation, I will provide an overview of the Technical Assistance Network, or TAN, including its purpose, how it works, and what information is accessible through TAN's Frequently Asked Questions page. Next, I'll introduce the Freedom of Information Act, also known as FOIA, and distinguish it from TAN as an entirely unique process for acquiring information. Then, I'll discuss the process for submitting a FOIA request. And finally, I will discuss what happens after you submit a FOIA request, including FDA's statutory obligations to respond and reasons why they may not disclose certain information. TAM is a portal on FDA's website for anyone to submit questions that they have relating to FISMA. TAN is an opportunity to ask very detailed questions about your personal circumstances and receive a direct response from FDA. The image on this slide is a screenshot of TAN's homepage on FDA's website. It shows you how to access the portal to submit a question, as well as where to find more information about FISMA through the Frequently Asked Questions link or the FISMA guidance documents. FDA created TAN because it realized many people, including farmers and educators, were unclear about the new FISMA rules. In creating a portal to house all FISMA submissions, FDA tracks the types of questions it receives, which then informs FDA on what it should include in the frequently asked questions. FDA also tracks trends to identify areas of FISMA that are particularly confusing and then can use that data to create additional guidance documents. It is important to note that TAN responses are not advisory opinions from FDA. You may still introduce a TAN response in court as evidence of information you were relying upon. However, FDA is not bound by the TAN response as it is with advisory opinions. Nonetheless, TAN responses can still be very helpful in answering both general and more specific questions about FISMA. TAM launched in September 2015. Since then, it has received over 11,000 inquiries. In TAM's first two years, FDA's overall medium response time was 16 business days. Of the 11,000 submissions, 372 are on the PSR, which in the first two years had a median response time of 48 days. FDA reported this longer response time was for PSR questions due to FDA needing more time to adequately address unique situations that it had not considered during the rulemaking process. In an effort to provide more information and alleviate some uncertainties, FDA has posted a few hundred frequently asked questions online, which are organized by category. The image on this slide is a screenshot of these categories. There are 32 questions in the PSR. FDA drafted these questions based on popular TAN topics, so they do not include any situation-specific information. Unlike TAN, FOIA is a federal statute that provides the public with the right to request access to any information from any federal agency. FOIA is primarily a tool used for making agency documents publicly available, rather than responding directly to questions like with TAM. FOIA requires agencies to disclose any communications that someone has requested. This could include phone calls, emails, or even TAM submissions. Submitting a question to TAN is easy and is the recommended option if you're looking for an answer to a very specific question or a unique scenario about FISMA. The image on the left is a screenshot of the form to submit a question through TAM. As you can see, this does not require much information from you. FDA tried to make this platform simple and accessible. The image on the top 
is a screenshot from the first out of five page form to submit a FOIA request. If you're submitting a FOIA request for FDA to disclose one particular TAN response, you will need to provide sufficient detail in that request for FDA to know exactly which response they should locate. Because of this need for specificity to disclose individual TAN submissions, FOIA requests are better suited for asking FDA to disclose a grouping of TAN responses. For instance, you could request FDA to disclose all responses relating to PCR, or even more specifically, all responses relating to PSR agricultural water standards. Presumably, you could also submit a FOIA request asking FDA to disclose all 11,000 TAN responses, though, as I'll discuss later, such a broad request might not be fully granted. Although the five-page form to submit a FOIA request may seem daunting, the process to submit a FOIA request is also relatively straightforward. But first, before submitting, FDA recommends you research whether the information you want to request is not already publicly available. If it is already available, FDA may not go through the trouble to disclose it and would direct you to the answer within the primary document source. If you can't find your answer in either of these, then you can make a FOIA request by submitting a written request to FDA's Division of the Freedom of Information Office. This includes sending mail, fax, or through the online portal. This is a screenshot from FDA's website to file a FOIA request. It shows what you'll need to include, such as name, address, telephone number, and a description of the information being sought, as well as where to send that request to. A FOIA request does not require you to provide a justification for your search. However, the more specific your request, the quicker and the cheaper it will likely be. Then, you'll simply have to wait to hear back from FDA. You will be charged a fee if the search takes FDA longer than two hours to find that information, which is more likely the case if you're going to request FDA to disclose all PSR or PCR questions on TAM. You should also expect fees if you're asking for duplicate documents or intend to be using that information for commercial purposes. However, you could request a waiver for certain circumstances. For example, if you demonstrate that the information fulfills a public interest or that you're a student, an educational institution, a nonprofit, or a member of the media. Additionally, FDA could limit or reduce the initial rate. Unlike questions submitted to TAN, FOIA requires FDA to respond to all requests. It responds to requests on a first-in, first-out system. FDA will notify you within a week of your submission to confirm that it has received your request and give you basic information about what to do in the event of an adverse determination. Then, FDA must respond within 20 business days. In this response, FDA must state whether the request will be granted, denied, that it needs more specificity, or that it'll simply need more time searching for your information. Although FOIA encourages transparency, not all information retained by agencies is able to be disclosed. FOIA has nine categories of exemptions that prevent FDA from disclosing certain information. For example, Exemption 3 bars information that is prevented from disclosure under another law. Exemption 4 bars any commercial or financial information from disclosure. Exemption 6 applies if there is any personal information where disclosure would constitute an unwarranted invasion of privacy, and Exemption 9 bars any geological or geophysical information. FDA may choose to redact exempt information in order to disclose partial responses to the requester. This is demonstrated in the image on the bottom right of the screen. FDA also has discretion not to respond to overly burdensome requests after balancing a public benefit by loss in searching and releasing that information. In addition to FOIA exemptions, the Privacy Act may prevent FDA from disclosing some information. 
The Privacy Act is meant to prevent an agency from releasing personally identifiable information, such as your name, education, financial transactions, or criminal history. Generally, the only way an agency could release this information is if, is, is if a Privacy Act exemption applies or if the person whom that information is about has, has directly consented to it being released. There are three possible reasons why SDA may not release certain records. First, SDA could not find the information you requested. Second, SDA failed to respond to FOIA requests. And third, the information was exempt under FOIA. In the TAM context, the first is unlikely because as long as the request is specific enough, that information should be easy to find since it's all held within the TAM portal. The second is possible, though the most common is the last. If you believe that FDA incorrectly applied a FOIA exemption, then you may appeal this decision to FDA's Division of Freedom of Information to give FDA the opportunity to correct its mistake. Courts refer to this appeal as exhausting administrative remedies. If FDA then does not reverse your decision, you may file a claim in a federal district court challenging FDA's decision. However, it's important to appeal the decision first to FDA before filing in courts because courts may dismiss a case even if the requester, excuse me, if the requester did not exhaust administrative remedies. And as a final takeaway, Submitting questions through, directly through TAN or submitting a FOIA request for FDA to disclose a TAN response are two very different options for, ask, for ac accessing more information about FISMA. Unlike TAN, FOIA provides some statutory requirements for FDA to respond as well as a path to remedy if you, would dis if you disagree with FDA not disclosing certain information. Additionally, FOIA would make information publicly available, which has the opportunity to help people with similar questions and similar circumstances, as these would be too specific to be included in the Frequently Asked Questions page, even if some information were to be redacted. So thank you all for your time and attention. I will now pass the mic back to Elizabeth to facilitate questions. Great, thank you so much for your presentations today. I want to um, let you know if you have questions, please put them into the question box and we will uh, read them so everybody can hear and then have the appropriate presenter respond. And so um, go ahead and enter them and let me open up the box. Okay, so um, great, thanks. Okay, so Don from ProSafety Alliance has a question uh, for Lauren. If you have time, could you take a second to speak a bit more about the epidemiological study done by FDA in support of the PSR water requirements? That information would be useful when evaluating same level of public health protection legitimacy of the supporting information. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, FDA has published its final hazard assessment, which is available online. Um, you can find it in the supporting guidance for the produce safety rule on their website. There is limited information about the methods they use specifically, although in guidance they've referenced the methods used by the World Health Organization as well as the EPA um, in, in collecting information about the circumstances around produce safety, and how different levels of contamination, especially related to recreational water under EPA guidance, relate to disease outcomes or illness outcomes of people who are affected or come in contact with the, those water sources. So I, I wish I had a bit more detail to speak to you about, about exactly what methods FDA used for those epidemiological studies, but FDA has seemed to encourage that we rely on the experience of experts who have the education, expertise, and training necessary to formulate a sufficient methodological approach for these studies to actually come up with this public health determination. Um, I'm hoping to dig a bit further into what those epidemiological studies might look like, um, though there hasn't been a lot of guidance published by FDA on exactly how thorough and what would be involved in each of those studies.
Great, thanks, Lauren. Please feel free, folks, to add more questions to the to the question box. Um, I'll also put a question out there to folks um, while we're talking about alternatives and variances. Um, I'm wondering if anybody from state departments of ag have started to explore the opportunity presented in variances or if that's still down the road or if you have thoughts around that or if you've heard of um, individuals looking to explore alternatives or have come to you about either alternatives or, or variances. Um, we've, we've heard that alternatives are sort of put off for now while the water rule is being revisited, but just wondering if folks have heard of other intentions, either from farmers or commodity groups or from departments of ag. So I'll put that out there for folks to respond into the comment box or the question box. Great, so Don follows up, thanks. I just uh, wanted to confirm that we are talking about the qualitative assessment of risk. We are not really allowed to feed people contaminated produce for research anymore. So a formal EPI study would be pretty challenging. Extrapolating from water risk for swimming is also challenging. Uh, yes, that's an excellent point. We cannot exactly work with a lab study of feeding people contaminated produce. However, FDA's guidance has been quite vague. They simply say that the necessary quantitative and qualitative information needs to be taken into account for any risk assessment that is done. Um, and often I think it's based on looking within particular regions at the normal levels of contamination that could be expected and then what disease outcomes they see within those regions and beyond that we don't know exactly they don't suggest doing some kind of a lab study or a formal lab study where we're trying to feed anyone contaminated produce and although there it is challenging to extrapolate from swimming and recreational water contamination that is one of the most thorough sources of scientific evidence FDA was able to rely upon from within different federal agencies in the US before it reached to international sources under the World Health Organization or Codex Alimentarius. Great, thanks Lauren. Uh, Dominique has a question. So I wonder if there is an opportunity to create a how-to guide for growers on how they might be able to develop an ag water alternative. Is this something that has been considered or perhaps in the works? Although I also wonder what the likelihood is of any grower developing an alternative would likely be done in conjunction with subject matter experts. I think that's an excellent point. It's something that I've considered throughout the semester about whether there would be any type of systematic approach. One difficulty facing that kind of how-to guide would be if there are particular regional factors that need to be taken in play. As I mentioned in my presentation, I think there's a, a source of opportunity here for individual growers who are introduced or who are interested in adopting an alternative to reach out to regional centers as they have a stronger connection directly with FDA and may have more connection with other experts, although this is still quite early in the process of developing these alternatives. And not each regional center may not be prepared right now to provide that, that service, but it could be something that could be a focus for development in the future. So Dominique, I'll ask you, um, have you heard anything from folks in, in Vermont uh, coming to the Agency of Ag looking for uh, information on alternatives and variances. So I'll let you answer that and then I'll turn to um, another question that we just got in the box. Bear with me. Okay, so Roland is asking, what is the level of public health protection that the ag water standards provide? Elizabeth, this is Sophia. Maybe before we go into that question, I just wonder about one more um, follow-up question for Dominique and, and for others on the line as well is whether a um, rather than a sort of a how-to regarding an alternative it's a how-to around providing more detail about the variance process it, it, some of the analysis is similar in the sense of the same level of public health protections 
standard or requirement being the same across across both pathways, but that maybe what we really want to be providing more information information on is how growers can work with their state authority to submit a petition to be able to get a variance approved, and that that if more information on that process would also be helpful. That's something we would be very interested in looking into more deeply. Thanks, Sophia. So I guess I'll just follow up to that. So Dominique wrote that, um, yes, I think it would be great approach for how to guide, how to connect, and how to start the process, etc. And then she also commented that, no, they have not heard of any variances or alternatives being set forth in Vermont. So um, I'll go back to Roland's question of what is the level of public health protection that the ag water standards provide? So again, the FDA has been silent in identifying a particular number or a particular reduction in risk that it's requiring. However, it says that based on the risk assessment, we need to look at the level of reduction in risk that's provided by implementing these safety, these safety requirements in terms of agricultural water quality. And this is where an epidemiological study would need to dig into likely the data that FDA gathered in its hazard assessment and then try and show quantitatively that the method that they are using also provides that same level of protection. Where I see that this could be quite difficult is if you're trying to propose using a different standard, for example, instead of measuring for generic E. coli, that is one of the most thoroughly tested standards out there in terms of agricultural water quality testing and relying on something else, say measuring salmonella or measuring listeria, there's not as much information out there that you could use to show that you've had a robust scientific evaluation that can show that that same level of protection is provided. This is where the burden is high for any person and for any farmer or any commodity group to be able to show that this alternative provides the same level of protection. Um, that's where I would encourage people to start collaborating with between industry groups, experts, and regional centers to try and create either a variance request or a proposal for a variance request to submit to a government authority or for an alternative to be worked on in collaboration with others. Thank you for that question. Yeah, thanks, Roland. And then I'll just comment too that Don followed up with um, a comment for Roland that um, this is of use uh, for Roland. The EPA study shows that for a person swimming in that water, if the source of the contamination were sewage, the level of risk is 3.6% for gastroenteritis, which is 36 in 1,000 swimmers, and translation to risk after using in, um, in contact with fresh produce has not been comprehensively done yet. So I appreciate that. Um, I also recognize we're over two o'clock, and so I'll I'll just say if folks have a couple more questions, go ahead. I don't want to cut conversation because it's um, I think productive, and I'll also just uh, convey Don's comment here. Um, really great information, in particular the detailed and practical example of splitting into two demonstrably separate businesses was really useful. And so before um, we end, and people need to to leave, please keep adding comments. We'll keep going here for a few more minutes if we've got more comments. But I also wanted to launch one final poll, and this is just to um, get a sense of the usefulness of today's presentation for you, one being not useful and five extremely. If you want to just give us a sense of how useful this information was, that would be um, helpful. And please go ahead, continue to to add questions. And please also, if something occurs to you later, feel free to follow up um, with any of us and we would be happy to, to give more information. Um, but this conversation is great. So if there are other comments or questions. Okay, and I'll go ahead and close that poll. Thanks for voting. Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything additional come in, and since we're over 2 o'clock, I guess we'll, we'll say goodbye, and thank you again for everybody's time this afternoon, and thank you especially to the clinicians and their time and energy put into research and um, preparing and delivering these presentations today. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it, and have a good afternoon.